Ne me dis pas, Patrice, cette fille est spiritus sancti, Amen. Intro et bois d'alta redei. Adium quietificat juventutem, Amen. Je dis qu'à mes déus et des chiens et causes, Amen, Amen, des gens et l'ancien sancta, abomine et quadroso et roue, Amen. Quia tu es Deus fortitudum, Amen, corem requisi et corretricit in chidodum affligit, Amen, Amenicus. Imite l'uccem, tu am, et veritatem, tu am, ipsa me deduxeront et adduxeront in mentem sanctum, tu met in tabernacula tua. Et in trebo et atarideii a Deum quiificat juventutem mea. Confite vorti vincit ara Deus et Deus meus, quare tristisas anima mea te quare conturbas me. Spera in Deo coniam a du confite vorili, salutare vultus mei et Deus meus. Gloria Patri et Filio et Spiritui Santo. Sicuterat in principio nuc et semper, et in secula seculorum amen. In trebo et alta redei. A Deum quiificat. Adiutorium nostrum in nomine Domini. Qui feci celum et terram. Confiteo Domini Potenti, Beate Maria Sempre Vecini, Beate Michele Acancelo, Beate Ioni Battiste. Santis Apostolis Petro et Paolo Omnibus Santis et Vobis Fratres, qui a peca venimis cogitation et verbo et opere. Mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. Ideo precor Beate Maria Sempre Vecinem, Beate Michele Marcancelo, Beate Ioni Battista. Sanctus Apostolus Petrum et Paolum omnes sanctus et vos fratres, orare pro mea Dominum Deum nostrum. Miserator tui omnipotens Deus, et dimis vis peccatis tui spericate vitam eternam. Amen. Confiteur de omnipotenti, Beate Marie et Saint Père Virginie, Beatum Celia Arcangelo, Beate Anne Baptiste, Sanctis Apostolis Petro et Paolo, omnibus sanctis et vi pater, quia peca vinimis cogitatione verbo et opere. Mia culpa, mia culpa, mia axima culpa. Idio precor beata Mariam Semper Virginem, beatum quel archangelum, beationem Baptistam, sanctos apostolos Petrum et Paulo, omnes sanctos et epater, ora repromé a Dominum Deum nostrum. Miserato vestri omnipotens Deus, et a dimissis peccatis vestris, paducat vos ad vita meternam. Amen. Indulgentia, nous solutionem et remissionem peccatorum nostrum, Deus tu conversus vivifica bis nos. E bless tu et abitur in te. Ostade nobis Domine, misericordiam tuam. Et salutare tuum da nobis. Domine ex audi orationem meam. Et clamor meus a te veniat. Dominus opiscum. Et cum spiritu tuum. Oremus. Salve Sancta Parens, in ixa puer pira regem, cucelum teram puer regit in secula seculorum, eructavit cormeum verbum bonum dico ego pera mea regi. Gloria Patri et Filio et Spiritui Sancto, sicuterat in principiot nunc et semper et in secula seculorum. Amen. Salve Sancta Parens, in ixa puer pira regem, cucelum teram puer regit in secula seculorum. Kyrie eleison, Kyrie eleison, Christ eleison, Kyrie eleison, Kyrie eleison, Gloria in excelsis Deo, et in terra pax omnibus boni voluntatis, laudamus te benedicimus te, adoramus te glorificamus te, gratia sagimus te vi propter maniam gloriam tuam, Domine Deus Rex Celestis, Deus Pater Omnipotens, Domine Filio Nigenite, Jesu Christe, Domine Deus Agnus Dei Filius Patris, qui tolis peccata mundi miserere nobis, qui tolis peccata mundi suscipe de precationem nostram, qui seres ad exteram Patris miserere nobis, quoniam tus salus sanctus, tus salus dominus, tus salus altissimus Jesu Christe, cum Sancto Spiritu, in gloria Dei Patris. Amen. Dominus Fabiscum, et cum Spiritu Tuo. Oremus. Concedinos famulos Tuos, quesumus Domine Deus, perpetuamente, et corporis sanitate gaudere, et gloriosa Beate Marie, et Sempe Virginis, intercessione, a presenti liberare tristizia, et eterna per frui letizia. Per Dominum nostrum, Iesum Christum, Filium tuum, qui te convivit et regnat in unitate Spiritus Sancti Deus, 
Per omnia secula seculorum. Amen. Lectio libri sapiensi. Ab initio tante secula creata sum et usque ad futurum seculum non desinam, et in habitatione sancta coram ipso ministravi. Et sic in sion firmata sum et in civitate sanctificata similiter equievi, et in Jerusalem potestas mea, et radicavin popolo nurificato, et in parte dei mei eredita silius, et in plenitudine sanctorum detensio mea. Deo gracias. Veredicta ad venerabilis es Virgo Maria, quae sine tactu pudoris inventa es mater salvatoris. Virgo dei genitris quam totus non capitorbis, in tua se clausit viscera factus homo. Alleluia, alleluia. Post partum virgo in violata per mansisti, dei genitrix intercede pro nobis, alleluia. Dominus Opiscum et Cum Spiritu Tuo. Sequentia Sancti Evangelii Secundum Locam. Gloria a Tui Domini. In illo tempore eloquente Iesu a turba, sextolens vocem quid a mulier de turba dixiti li, beatus venter quid te porta vite tu bera que succisti, ati le dixit quid nimo beati qui audi un verum dei, et custodi un tilud. Dominus Obiscum et cum spiritu tuo. Oremus. Ave Maria, gratia plena Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in mulieribus et benedictus fructus ventris tui.
Per omnia secula seculorum. Amen. Dominus vobiscum. Et cum spiritu tuo. Sursum cauda. Abemus a Domino. Gratia sagamus Domino Deo nostro. Dignum et justum est. Vere dignum et justum est e cum et salutare. Nos tibi semper et ubique gratia sagere. Domine sancte pater omnipotens et enedius. Et te in veneratione betem Mariae semper veginis calaudare benedicere et predicare. Qui et unigenitum tuum sancti spiritus sovum bratione concepit. Et de virginitatis gloria permanente lumen eternum mundo et fudit, Iesum Christum Dominum nostrum. Per quem aiestatem tuam laudant angelia d'oron dominazione estremum potestatis, celi celorum que virtutes, albeata serafim socia exultazione concelebrant, cum quibus ad nostras voces ut admiti iubeas de precamur, supplici confessione dicentes. Sanctus, Sanctus, Sanctus Dominus Deus Sabaut, plenison celi et terra gloria tua, Hosanna in excelsis. Benedictus qui venit in nomine Domini, Hosanna in excelsis.
Nobisco pui peccatoribus. Per omnia secura securorum. Amen. Oremus. Precepti salutaribus moniti et divina institutione formatio de mus discere. Pater noster quesin celis sanctificetur lamentum, adveniat regnum tuum fiat voluntas tua sicut in cielo et in terra. Panem nostrum quotidianum da nobis odie, et dimite nobis debita nostra sicut et nos dimitimus debitoribus nostris. Et ne nous inducas in tentationem. Se libera nous sommes à Per omnia secula seculorum. Amen. Pax Domini sit sempre vobiscum. Et cum spiritu tu. Agnus de equitolis peccata mundi, miserere nobis. Agnus de equitolis peccata mundi, miserere nobis. Agnus de equitolis peccata mundi, dona nobis pacem. Domini non sunt dignus. Domini non sunt dignus. Domini non sunt dignus.
Confiteur de Omnipotenti, Beate Marie Saint Père Yoshni, Beatum Kelly Arcangelo, Beatione Battiste, Sanctis Apostolis Petro et Paolo, Omnibus Sanctis et Ibi Pater, Quia Pecavinimi Scotch Diacione, Verbo et Opere, Mea culpa, mea culpa, mea xema culpa. Ideo precor Beatam Mariam Saint Père Virginem, Beatum Kelly Arcangelum, Beationem Battistam, Sanctos Apostolos Petrum et Paulum, Omnes Sanctos et Epater, Ora Repromé à Dominum Deum Nostrum. Vi attaccio la Maria e ci inizio a portare con te i parti studium. Mi dà il mio servizio e con scritto tu. Oremos. 
Son fils de Dominé, Salutis, nos stress, nos divis, la cause nous, Béat et Mar, Béat et Saint-Père, Régis, Patrocinis, nos soubis, et protégés, qui ne connaissent les générations et tous les félimus maïstati. Père de Dominé, nos premiers, son Christ, son filioutum, qui t'a convié la traînée à la divinité de l'Espérité, son petit Dieu, Père Homme, et ainsi pour la séculaire. Amen. 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 Benedicat vos omnipotens Deus. Pater filius et spiritus sanctus. Amen. Dominus vobiscum et cum spiritu. Initium sancti evangelii secundum Ioannem. Gloria ti vidum. In principio iura verbum et verbum erat apud Deum et Deus era verbum. Hoc erat in principio apud Deum. Omnia per ipsum facta sunt et sin ipso factum est nihil quod factum est. Amen. 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 In ipso vita erat el vita erat lux amen lumen lux in tenebris tuce et tenebri eam non comprehenderunt. Fuito momissus adeo cui nomen erat Ioannes, si quenit in testimonium o testimonium per libere de lumine, ut omnes crederent per ilum. Non erat il lux et lux testimonium per libere de lumine. Erat lux vera cui luminat omne momine veniente minup mondum. In mondo erat et mondus per ipsum factus est et mondus eum non poniovit. In propria venit et sui eum non receperunt. Quat quototem rechepperunt eum deliteis potestat em filios dei fieri, is qui credunt in nomine eius, qui non ex sanguinibus, ne qui ex voluntate carnis, ne qui ex voluntate viris, et ex pleonatis sunt. Et verbum caru factum est, et habita vit in nobis, et vidimus gloria meius, gloriam quasi unigenitia patri, plenum gratiae et veritatis. Deo gracias. A few weeks ago, on the Feast of Christ the King, we considered the fact that God has the right to have his supreme dominion over all creation be explicitly recognized by his rational creatures. Those are the angels and the men. In other words, rational creatures, angels and men, owe submission, obedience, adoration, and due worship and praise to God. We saw that, in fact, it is a divinely appointed duty of the Catholic Church to instruct us in exactly these matters so that we will know exactly what it is that God expects of us. We saw that one of our specific duties is to join with the holy angels in the adoration and praise of God on behalf of all creation, to beg from him the graces necessary for mankind to fulfill their duties and to render him due worship. And this is so important that God has set aside certain men specifically for his task priests and religious. The last time we considered the importance of the divine office from this point of view, today let's briefly consider some aspects of the holy sacrifice of the Mass. Now some of this in the beginning will be a review. We'll start at the beginning, in the Garden of Eden. Why? Because everything in our holy religion is related in some way to the Garden of Eden. The word paradise means a hedged-in garden. Now Moses tells us that in the beginning, before the garden was destroyed in the great flood, there were four great rivers flowing out of the Garden of Eden. Since Eden was hedged in, and since rivers flow downhill, this tells us that the Garden of Eden was an enclosed sanctuary set on top of a mountain. It's the very threshold of heaven. It's the intersection between heaven and earth where man can commune with God. But it wasn't the kind of place where men were supposed to just lounge around. Man was supposed to keep and guard the garden. The privilege of living in God's presence is based on obedience. If man disobeyed, he'd be punished with death. If man disobeyed, the whole natural order would be disrupted. If man disobeyed, 
childbearing would be painful. If man disobeyed, work would become difficult and tiring. If man disobeyed, he'd be driven away from the privilege of living in intimate union with God. He'd be driven away from the privilege of living in God's presence. He'd be banished from the garden with the tree of life. He would no longer be able to live in that beautiful sanctuary on the mountaintop out of which flowed rivers of water. And what happened? Man disobeyed. And all these disasters fell upon him. And he's driven out, and Eden was closed to him. The entrance to Eden was closed. It was covered, it was veiled. Man was no longer holy. The holy place where man had once walked with God was veiled. He no longer had access to it. And God placed cherubim and a flaming sword turning every way to keep anyone from entering the garden and approaching the tree of life. We all know the results of that original sin. Sin, sickness, suffering, and death entered the world. Man loses the life of grace. He loses the privilege of a close, intimate relationship with God. Heaven is slammed shut, and men are now in bondage to Satan. Now what lessons can we draw from Eden? In the Garden of Eden, we see a prototype of the conditions and environment in which man can safely encounter God. For example, we're introduced to the idea that separation is an essential aspect of holiness and that there are degrees of holiness. Time has different levels of holiness. In time, the Sabbath is more holy than the other days of the week. It's been set aside for God. Space has different levels of holiness. The sanctuary of the garden on the mountaintop is holier than the outside. Things have different degrees of holiness. The tree of life is holier than the other trees in the garden. People have different levels of holiness. There's no comparison between Adam's holiness before he fell and afterwards. So the key notion is that holiness is determined by the degree to which something has been set aside for and dedicated to God. We see a basic pattern. Adam was given the command to keep and guard the first sanctuary on earth, the Garden of Eden. He disobeyed, and he and all his descendants were driven out. The basic principle here is that the closer a man approaches to the ineffably holy presence of Almighty God, the more his accountability increases, and the stricter his punishments become for any infractions. We see a basic result of sin. Immediately after the fall, when God is questioning Adam, Adam begins making excuses for his sin. God asks, quote, Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman who thou gavest to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. Close quote. Adam makes excuses. He throws the blame for his sin on his wife and even on God. The woman you made for me gave me the fruit. The fall of man clearly teaches us that sin not only leads to further separation from God, but even from one another. There's a very important symmetry here. Holiness, obedience, and closeness to God all go together and are opposed to sinfulness, rebellion, and distance from God and one another. We see a basic temptation, the idea of self-determination. I'll do what I want. The lie of the serpent was that man could be as a god, deciding what was good and evil. But in spite of the devil's lies, man remains a creature, and therefore he is bound by the laws of his creator. In other words, he's bound to do what God wants. And man can only have a true relationship with God by carefully keeping his divine laws. Thanks a lot to Adam, man is now seriously damaged by original sin and born without grace and the gifts, under the dominion of the devil. Those exorcisms before baptism aren't there for nothing. As St. Paul puts it, by nature, we are born children of wrath. Children of wrath. Thanks a lot, Adam. So the lessons we can draw from Eden are, one, holiness is determined by the degree to which something has been set aside for and dedicated to God. Two, the closer man approaches to the ineffably holy presence of Almighty God, the more his accountability increases and the stricter his punishments come for any infractions. Three, holiness, obedience, and closeness to God all go together and are opposed to sinfulness, rebellion, and distance from God and one another. And four, the basic temptation is the idea of self-determination. I'll do what I want.
Now, with all that in mind, let's consider a few of the events of the Exodus. Fifty days after Israel passed through the Red Sea, Moses goes up on Mount Sinai. He receives the Ten Commandments. A cloud veiled the Lord, so it protected Moses and made it possible for him to enter into God's presence without being killed. During all this, while Moses is on top of the mountain, the mountain's shaking, it's smoking, there's earthquakes, there's flames and bolts of lightning, roar of thunder and the blare of, of trumpets and whirlwinds and storms. And while all this is going, right there at the base of the mountain, the people rise up and commit idolatry. Now think about that. Right in front of them is this huge mountain. It's smoking, covered with a cloud, flames and lightning and thunder and trumpet blasts, and they rise up in sin, set up an idol right in God's face, and then refuse to serve him. Then the tribe of Levi takes the Lord's side and kills thousands of idolaters. Because of their obedience, what does God do? He sets the tribe of Levi aside to be his priestly tribe. At Mount Sinai, we see that the word of God carved on stone tablets, the law, is handed down from God to man on a mountaintop, an elevated sanctuary. In the destruction of the sinners by the swords of Levites, we again see that the closer man approaches the Almighty God, the more his accountability increases, and the stricter his punishments become for any infractions. In the selection of Levites as a priestly tribe, we again see that key notion that obedience to God's will leads to holiness, and holiness means being set farther apart from profane use and dedicated to God. God dictated to Moses even the smallest details of how the Old Testament religious ceremonies were to be performed. The tent-like church that Israel used before they built the temple was called the tabernacle, and it was designed by God. The Holy of Holies was the most sacred part of the tabernacle, and later the temple, which is a permanent structure built on Mount Moriah in Jerusalem, built to the same basic pattern as the tabernacle. Inside the Holy of Holies was the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark is a golden box which contained the Ten Commandments in a jar of manna, the bread from heaven. It had a golden lid with two cherubim all on it, over which the glory cloud of the Lord appeared. And that's the Old Testament equivalent of the real presence. The Holy of Holies was covered with a massive veil, embroidered with the images of cherubim, because it's a symbolic Garden of Eden and Mount Sinai and heaven. How can it be symbolically a Garden of Eden? That's easy. This is where the glory cloud of the Lord, the presence of God, would dwell. But since the fall, man was no longer able to dwell in the presence of the Lord, which is why the Holy of Holies, this liturgical Garden of Eden, is veiled. It was closed. Why were there cherubim embroidered on the veil? Just as God placed cherubim at the entrance of the Garden of Eden to keep man out after the fall, so also the cherubim on the veil are symbolically guarding away into the Holy of Holies, reminding everyone, even the priests, there's no longer any access to this intimate presence of God, except in the case of the high priest, and that's only once a year. There's no longer access at all to the inside of the ark, to the manna, the bread from heaven. These things have been veiled to men. Now Aaron was consecrated as the high priest in ceremonies that took seven days. First, he's washed to remove the soil and the stains of the fallen world. Then he's protected by the blood of the lamb when Moses sacrificed a ram and daubed its blood and Aaron's ear and, ear and thumb and big toe. And he's clothed with beautiful vestments. Now all this was done so that Aaron, as the high priest, could work safely at the very threshold of the sanctuary in front of the presence of the Lord. Aaron was then ordered to guard the tabernacle to stand in the doorway for seven days and seven nights under the pain of death. And then on the eighth day, the first day of the new week, Aaron offers up sacrifice for himself and the people. And God's so pleased with the sacrifice that he sends down fire from heaven, which burns the offerings on the altar. What does all this mean? It's a recreation week. The eighth day is the first day of the new week, the new creation. Symbolically, liturgically, Aaron has been consecrated as the new Adam, who is supposed to faithfully guard the new garden. The words that sacred scripture uses to describe the duties of the priests and Levites as they work around and guard the sanctuary are exactly the same words that are used to describe Adam's duties of working and guarding the garden. See, the job of the priests representing the people of Israel is to perform rites 
that symbolize the service of the nation as a whole right there in front of the Holy of Holies, right there at the very threshold of the place where God is present. We should also know that God dictated even the smallest details of how the religious ceremonies were to be carried out, and every detail was to be carried out under the pain of death. Did God really mean that? You better believe it. Right after the ordination, two of Aaron's sons tried to offer incense in a way, quote, such as God had not commanded them, close quote. What happened? The Bible tells us, quote, fire came forth from the presence of the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord, close quote. God killed his own priests because of liturgical abuse. He means what he says, and that was a divine punishment for liturgical abuse in the olden days. Okay, we can see how the Holy of Holies represents the Garden of Eden. What does it have to do with Mount Sinai? Just as the cloud on Mount Sinai served as a veil and made it possible for Moses to be safe in God's presence, so also the cloud of incense used in the sanctuary protected the priests of the Old Covenant from the divine presence in the Holy of Holies. At Mount Sinai, the faithful couldn't see God giving the tablets to Moses. And in the temple, the faithful couldn't see the Ark of the Covenant, and they couldn't see the altar of incense. But just as they could see the smoke and the fire on Mount Sinai, so also they could see the smoke pouring out from the top of the tabernacle or the temple when the incense was offered, and so also they could see the altar of burnt offerings in the courtyard of the temple. And on that altar, they could see this perpetual fire that had fallen down from heaven, and the priest had to keep burning on the altar. Now, we could go on and on drawing more and more of these prefigurements out, and later we will, but we've got to start tying this together today. Let's start by today's summarizing by pointing out that the rubrics matter, which is to say that doing rituals by the book, exactly as written, is essential. The job of Catholic priests was prefigured by the priests in the Old Testament. And just as the sanctuary of Eden or the tabernacle was the very threshold of heaven where man came into communion with God, so also an altar right here in church is the very threshold of heaven where the priest, by his strict obedience to liturgical rubrics, not only visibly proclaims the holiness of God's name, but even brings God down into communion with man. And now the priest can go behind the veil into the Holy of Holies, not just once a year, but every day. He can give us the fruit of the tree of life. He can open the ark, which is a ciborium. And because he can do that, we can receive that heavenly bread every day. Only now, it's not a shadow. It's not a prefigurement. It's God himself. Moses came down from the holy mountain with the word of God carved into stone tablets. The priest comes down with the word of God made flesh. Notice also that to even come up here during ceremonies, we have to have on special clothing and act in very special, specific ritualistic ways because we're in the holiest place. The celebrant compared to the altar boys, has even even more specialized vestments. Each one of these has been consecrated specifically to be used in the worship of God. They have special prayers that I say as I'm putting each one of them on. Each particular part of the, uh, each each, uh, vestment has a particular prayer that has to be said for each article that's put on. It is fair to say that the liturgy directly forms our notion of the holiness of God. Look at Sinai. Look at the tabernacle. Look at this sanctuary. We took seven years in seminary, not seven days, seven years going through a series of consecrations, being set ever further apart from the rest of you, giving up all kinds of natural goods in pursuit of holiness. And all this is done precisely so we can work up here safely, so that we can safely take your pleas to God and bring his message to you so we can act in the person of Christ and not be a scandal and a stumbling block to all y'all. Our job is to reform rites that express the servants and obedience to the church as a whole right there in front of the Holy of Holies, right there at the very threshold of heaven. We spoke of the idea of a recreation. This is critical to understand. God has designed the structure of reality in such a way that the liturgy repairs and restores creation. God has designed the structure of reality in such a way that the liturgy repairs and restores creation. It reestablishes the limits and restores the damages unleashed by sin. 
What goes on in the divine liturgy determines what goes on out in the world. The graces that were lost by Adam, the terrible offenses that have been offered to God, the liturgy makes amends for all this. The liturgy reorders our fallen world. And once we realize that the liturgy reorders all creation, we can begin to understand the real horror of liturgical abuse. What is a priest saying when he deliberately abuses the liturgy? Symbolically, liturgically, he's reenacting the original sin right in God's face. Instead of order, he's bringing disorder. Instead of grace, he's bringing sin. Instead of spiritual health, he's bringing spiritual sickness. Instead of everlasting life, he's bringing spiritual death. Instead of keeping the serpents out of the garden and away from his people, he's turning to them and inviting them to come on in. In effect, the priest is saying, I will not serve. I'll do it my way. I will dictate liturgical relationships to God. I will set myself apart from his law. I will be a law unto myself. I will exalt myself. He's imitating the sons of Aaron, and unless he repents, he'll get the same kind of punishment. But it isn't just the priest who's going to suffer. We're all going to suffer, all of us. What goes on in the divine liturgy determines what goes on in the world. That's reality. That's the way it is. So what are we saying? We're saying that when massive numbers of the officially appointed ambassadors who represent the church militant before the heavenly court, when massive numbers of these divinely appointed ambassadors, that is to say priests, are constantly and consistently reenacting the original sin right in the face of God, we're going to get exactly what we got the first time. Sin, suffering, nakedness, disorder, despair, death, and the reign of Satan. We're saying we're going to get exactly what we are getting. This culture of death, this present darkness, this new paganism. The culture of death is the natural result of massive liturgical abuse. The culture of death is the natural result of massive liturgical abuse. The most important aspect of the solution to the problem, of all these kind of societal problems, is liturgical. It always has been, and it always will be. Now we've got a lot more conclusions, but no more time, so we'll pick this topic up again later after the end of the world sermons. St. Alphonsus says, quote, the Lord commanded the priests of the old law to tremble through reverence when approaching his sanctuary. And still we see scandalous irreverence in priests of the new law when they stand at the altar in the presence of Jesus Christ. St. Teresa of Avila used to say, I would give my life for a ceremony of the church. And will a priest despise the ceremonies of the Holy Mass? Close quote. St. Teresa of Avila used to say, I would give my life for a ceremony at church. Will a priest despise the ceremonies of the Holy Mass? Let's pray. Dear Lord, so many priests have forgotten that they are your chosen souls. As we pray for them, help us to remember our own utter weakness misery and nothingness were it not for your grace we would be far far worse than those for whom we pray Lord we beg you pour down your grace upon the priests who at this very moment need it the most help those priests who are faithful to remain faithful to those who are falling stretch forth your divine hand that they may grasp it as their support and for those poor, unfortunate souls who have fallen, lift them up in the great ocean of your mercy, that being engulfed therein, they may receive the grace to return to your great loving heart. 
Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.